everybody. Um, I'm Sarah, as Daniel said. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm very excited today to introduce Ian Bogo. Ian is the Ivan Allen Distinguished Chair in Media Studies and a professor of interactive computing at Georgia Institute of Technology. He, whew, um, he also holds an appointment <laughs> in the Scheller College of Business. Um, he will be in dialogue with Jeffrey Schnapp, who is a faculty director of Metalab, a uh, co-director of the Brookman Klein Center of Internet and Society, and he is the Pesco Solido Chair in uh, Romance and Comparative Literatures here at Harvard. Uh, today, Ian will be talking about uh, a pessimist's guide to the future of technology. Um, as we were just discussing, pessimism, pessimism is clearly popular uh, based on the turnout today, and rightfully so. <laughs> a vote of confidence. <laughs> and rightfully so, in this age of celebration of technology, it's really important to, to have the critical in dialogue with the, the celebration and the, the embrace of technology that we have here at the Berkman Klein Center in our, our extended community. Um, Ian is also the author or co-author of 10 books. He is the co-founder of Persuasive Games. Um, he's a game designer and scholar. Uh, he is also a contributing writer to The Atlantic and is a co-editor of um, the platform series, the platform studies, studies yeah. series um, published yeah. by the MIT Press and the object lesson series published by Bloomsbury and the Atlantic. Yes. Um, Jeffrey uh, is a cultural historian whose interests range from antiquity to the present. He is also a pioneer in the digital humanities and his works range from books to curatorial practice um, and beyond. Uh, the emphasis of Ian's talk today will be on autonomous vehicles as a test case and the dialogue should be really interesting because Jeffrey just completed teaching a course on robots in the built environment here at Harvard. Um, it's almost like I was thinking about that. <laughs> I also learned recently that um, Ian has an unusual perspective on what constitutes a sandwich, um, which <laughs> might include a head of lettuce. Um, and this might be interesting to those in the Berkman community because we've been talking about sandwiches recently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just um, everything's a sandwich. Exactly. Just, 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 just get it over with. All uh, so with that, thank you for yeah. being here. And we'll make sure we save some time at the end for questions. Great. Um, OK, I am so happy to be here. Uh, I, I just flew in. So um, uh, y y you welcome me with this nice rainy, rainy weather, which I'll forgive you for. Uh, <laughs> when I was. Uh, a first-year undergraduate philosophy student uh, had this, this very stern and severe uh, Scottish uh, instructor. Uh, and uh, he, he, he was kind of against everything, it seemed. <laughs> um, and we were talking about Kant, uh, Kant's moral philosophy, uh, of course, the, the categorical imperative. And uh, the idea of the categorical imperative is, is that, uh, according to Kant, one should act on a, on a maxim only if uh, one can imagine it becoming a universal law. This is sort of the the, the one-liner in Kant's uh, moral philosophy. Uh, and you know, philosophers are, are kind of trolls, kind of the original uh, academic trolls, right? <laughs> nothing, nothing makes them happy. They're very grouchy about everything. It's all about sort of sneers and barbs and <clears throat> daggers in the side. Uh, and so this, this, uh, this instructor had this, um, this counterpoint, this sort of re re reductio ad absurdum uh, uh, to Kant's moral philosophy, which apparently I've not forgotten and will never forget, which was, OK, well, if you should act on, on every maxim as if it should become a universal law, then this should work for every maxim, according to Kant. <coughs> Anything that you can, you can suppose should be testable for, for its moral uh, quality against this, this premise. Uh, so what about I, I will play in order to exercise and keep myself physically fit, I will play tennis in the mornings at 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, so if you run that scenario and you say, well, imagine if everyone uh, played tennis at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning in order to keep physically fit. Uh, then it breaks down because all, everyone would, would crowd the tennis courts. No one could play tennis at all. Therefore, you must not play tennis uh, at 10 o'clock a.m., which, of course, seems preposterous. So this is you know, uh, one example of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, one way of thinking about, about these ideas that doesn't seem quite right but is insightful in the sense that it shows that, that um, there are these reversals, these kind of edge cases are at their, at their negative ends or at their extremes. Things change. They change form. And so something that's sort of thinkable um, a, a, in a reasonable way, um, at the center, once it moves to the edges, and then once the center moves to that edge, uh, then, it, then it alters somewhat, it changes. Now, Kant's maybe not the best tool to think about this, um, uh, but Marshall McLuhan um, 
uh, and his son Eric uh, in this book that no one reads, unfortunately, <laughs> called uh, Laws of Media, have this interesting uh, media <coughs> philosophy of these four, these four laws, which, which you see here, enhancement, retrieval, reversal, and obsolescence. And we don't have time to go into all of this, but what's interesting about it for the present conversation is that uh, for the McLuhans, uh, this idea of, of reversal that, like, that is a kind of a, like a property of, of, of media. It's not something that happens later when things go wrong. Uh, it's an intrinsic property that all four of these laws are kind of active on, uh, on media objects. And of course, for McLuhan, everything is kind of a, a media object. That's the, 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 you know, the electric light bulb, famously, and so forth. Um, and, and they run these, these scenarios in this, in this book of these, of these tetrads. Uh, this is the cigarette, uh, you know, which enhances <clears throat> calm and retrieves group security. You can all go together and smoke. Um, and the, the reversal, the thing that happens when the cigarette is, is pushed to, extreme, to its extremes uh, or its limits uh, is it becomes this, uh, this addiction, right? The, your nervousness, you're, you're no longer calm because now you want, you want the cigarette that you, can't, that you can't have. There are dozens of these in this book. This is the Xerox <laughs> machine. I guess the interesting thing about the Xerox is the, 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 the reversal scenario uh, from the McLuhans is that everybody becomes a publisher, which is something we used to talk about uh, in a very positive way, and now we're not quite so, <laughs> quite so sure about um, uh, any longer. Um, or, or maybe this example. Uh, this is the, the car. Um, there's all sorts, of, all sorts of interesting and bizarre things going on here, and we, we again, won't take the time to unpack them all. But um, the knight in shining armor is the, uh, the retrieved medium, this idea that like, there's something from the past that, that comes uh, uh, to the surface in the present. So I guess this, you know, you can now get out of any situation. Certainly this is what car share services are like now. Um, but you know, this is obvious that the, the car, when pushed to its limits, when everyone has a car, everyone is in their car at once, then you get traffic, which is the opposite uh, of mobility and free. It's interesting that freedom and mobility are not the thing that, that the McLuhans identify, but privacy, but it's okay. This is just a tool. Um, it makes perfect sense. And so I, I give you this example in particular, but not only because we're going to talk about uh, autonomous uh, vehicles a little bit, or I'm going to riff on that a little bit, but also because you can see how it just makes sense that it's not that there's something wrong when you get traffic jams. There's something intrinsic to the design object that is the automobile in its urban context that is traffic. That's part of what the car is. And, th and that's the insight um, that, that the McLuhans had in this, uh, in this tool. Now, the, the pessimism business was a little bit of a, I don't know, I mean, I am, I think, a natural pessimist. But, you know, <laughs> it, in this moment that we're in today with technology, where we're, we're, I think, shifting finally into a mode where it's possible to be critical without getting sneered at, if we kind of look back at the, um, I don't know, the optimistic aspirationalism that we've, that we've been using to encounter technology in the broadest sense, and we look back on those, on those moments uh, of the recent past or even the distant past, we can see how things, how we knew how things were going to turn out, actually. We just weren't paying them heed. So, um, you know, we kind of knew 25 years ago that the, the notion of, um, of identity and uh, anonymity online was, tr was trouble. <coughs> We knew that, and we just made jokes about, ha, that's funny, let's move on, right? But, but you know, that, that turned out to be an intrinsic part for, be, for good and for ill, right? Um, or this is from about, uh, well, it's 2006. You can see back when we were celebrating how blogging was going to do away with these gatekeepers that were keeping people out of, uh, of sharing and spreading ideas, and that was just terrific. Um, and, you know, okay, well, what happens? Like, just, just think about it for, like, 10 seconds. What happens when any idea can be shared and can't be distinguished from any other idea? Well, uh, you, you, you have no quality control and no ability to discern uh, which ideas are sort of even, you know, not just desirable, but even true. Uh, we, we, we knew this, and we just kind of went headlong into it, thinking, well, this is great. We'll, we'll, we, nothing can, can, can go wrong. Um, or with, uh, with, uh, with these devices, which I've previously called the, the, the cigarette of the, of the 21st century, <laughs> these, 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 these guys. The, the, the relationship, my, I feel mine buzzing in my pocket literally right now as I'm talking. Um, the relationship we have with our smartphones universally, um, we knew that it was, we, we had these pagers and then the Blackberry, which was this evolution of the pager into, into email and so forth, that that, that role of the, uh, of the important person, the, the doctor, or, or then the executive, or the, or the you know the 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 the, uh, the governmental worker, what have you, who had to be connected to what was happening. Um, that when that when that universalized, we would all be working essentially laboring 
uh, all the time, which is, which is what we're doing. We're not always laboring for our workplaces. Often it's for wealthy technology companies or for our own personal brands or whatnot uh, or what have you. So, um, you know, and, and like now we're kind of going, oh, shit. You know, this, um, we know now that, that some of the ways that uh, even for those who were involved in creating uh, these infrastructures, um, uh, they're kind of admitting now, yeah, this was, like, we weren't thinking even, even a, a little bit uh, about the, the implications of, of what we were making. And that's a nice conclusion to come to after you've made a boatload of money and it, it, might, not, it might not matter uh, so much anymore. So uh, I've been thinking about this whole question, this whole sort of set of ideas in the context of uh, autonomous vehicles. And I picked them partly because I'm legitimately interested uh, and partly because they are so new that we've not yet made these errors with them, we we haven't committed in any in any at either at a design level, an urban planning level, at a kind of personal use level, we have some uh, some runway, uh, some blue sky uh, to work with. Uh, but when you look at the way, even now that we're kind of talking about this future, it's either as this sort of like wonderful, like fi finally we'll be able to rid ourselves of these awful machines that we despise, <clears throat> the, the, and we can you know it'll just be easy to get anywhere you want to go. You won't have to maintain and pay for a car. That's one of those scenarios. And another one of these sort of these sort of I, I'm really looking forward to self-loathing cars. This is a good comic, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> or or the, the, the the last step in the in the milestone if you can't see is cars capable of arguing about the trolley problem. <laughs> uh, on Facebook, like this is funny. This is you know, it, but it, it's also a signal that you know we kind of it's a kind of cursory uh, take on on what what these futures of, of autonomous cars might look like. So I've been thinking about this for a little while. We don't have to just talk about autonomous vehicles, but I think it's an interesting mm -hmm. test case. Um, and I've been running through a number of of sort of you know likely scenarios in in this kind of McLuhanite way. If we take this thing and we imagine pushing it to its extreme so that it, it really is universal, what happens? What takes place? And I'm just going to run through um, some notes uh, of so some of the things that seemed likely uh, to me at, at, at universal scale. It, it sort of went fully rolled out. Um, one of those is that all of the, the trolley problem business, like is the car going to run down pedestrians, is a very, very temporary problem that has to do with this transition mode between uh, 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 human-driven cars and pedestrians and, and, and bicycles and so forth and, and fully autonomous cars. Once you get uh, vehicles... Um, uh, that are fully autonomous, and once you roll them out completely, then uh, one of the likely things that will happen is that the way that, that, that roads uh, operate will also change. So uh, you can pack autonomous vehicles much closer together. They all, you have that sort of like minority report vision, if you remember the, 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 the tracks of, of, of Lexus branded vehicles that are sort of swap, you know, very, very high speeds, you know, swapping places with one another. Uh, these cars can coordinate with one another. Um, and so it, it's not so much that it will be in, in undesirable or, or no longer a technical problem that people or other people uh, or other humans driving uh, traditional vehicles might be at risk, uh, but it will no longer be feasible for them to even participate in that mode uh, of conveyance. Uh, to the point that uh, it strikes me as likely, not just possible, but likely, um, that especially major arterials um, will become the sort of new freeways uh, that will be inaccessible to uh, to not just human drivers, uh, but as right-of-ways um, whatsoever for, for pedestrians, uh, for, for cyclists. Um, and they'll do that because it will no longer be safe to interact with the way that the, the autonomous cars um, uh, are, are behaving. Um, another thing that will change is if you, th th I was recently in, in Tempe where Uber is running a, uh, one of their test <laughs> markets for, for these, these autonomous cars. And they have people in them still. But even so, you, you realize that even if you were on the road with them, your relationship with the driver in the vehicle as a pedestrian, as a cyclist, as another driver is, is very important. You kind of know, okay, I kind of, like, I kind of have a sense of what you might do even if I can't see your eyes because I know, I know the, the possibility space of things that people do. But we don't, we don't understand um, what computers do anymore uh, most of the time. And, and the, the, the programmers of these systems often don't understand how they work when we get into these, these deep AI, ML. Uh, kinds of systems, and that's exactly what autonomous cars are. So even if you are in the same space as one of these vehicles, you'll have no idea uh, what its capacities are and what it might and what it might do. Uh, so you can no longer read uh, those those apparatuses; they're no longer legible. So you know, if you kind of run that scenario out, you know, maybe it would just be better to take this thing that we've had since we've maintained public roads, which is the idea of the public right of way, that all of us can go out to the street and use the street, and it's, ma it's maintained and owned by a governmental entity, by a municipality, by a county, what have you, by a state, uh, and they're responsible for it, and, and as a result, everyone has the capability of using it. 
um, maybe, maybe that doesn't make so much sense anymore. And in fact, it's become very expensive uh, uh, to maintain uh, American infrastructure, as we all know, and it's, you know, it's kind of falling apart. Uh, and so when you have wealthy technology companies that are absolutely going to roll out autonomous vehicles as car services, uh, kind of Uber-style car services, not as, uh, uh, as conveyances that you would buy and own in garage uh, yourself, um, then just in the same way that Amazon uh, is essentially, you're getting these unbelievable bribes out of municipalities that want to host its new headquarters, you know, maybe it's best just to lease off um, those spaces uh, to Google, to, to Tesla, to Uber, to whoever those players are, um, in order that they can kind of manage them and upgrade them to smart roads so that they can, you know, make them even, uh, even more efficient. Uh, and this might mean that you would, you, you could, I mean, it'll start with the larger, the larger streets, but then it'll certainly bleed into smaller ones. Um, maybe there'll be times when you can't use your own road. Like imagine you kind of walk out of your house and you no longer have access, or at least not direct public access, to that space. You can even imagine a sort of uh, blockchain-driven smart contracts kind of system where you've got your phone in your pocket, right, and you want to cross the street. Uh, this, is, you know, this is like Philip K. Dick stuff, right? <laughs> you, you just want to cross the street, and it's fine for you to cross the street at certain, as long as there's no vehicles in the area, you'll just be charged a small fee invisibly uh, when you <laughs> enter into that, because it's private property now, uh, or at least it's leased off in such a way that, that it's construed uh, as private property. Um, once that takes place, you know, when you don't need things like traffic lights, for example, because those are managing human-driven vehicles, and these autonomous uh, uh, fleets are much more efficient, just yank out the traffic lights, and they will invisibly coordinate uh, uh, their behavior with one another. Well, when you take those sorts of things out, one of the things that comes along with them are the, um, uh, the wayfinding devices, street signs, street names. Those are all uh, put up for our benefit as human uh, 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 drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, uh, and, and, and so forth. And they're quite unsightly when you think about it. Who likes to look at traffic lights or street signs? Um, so let's just, maybe let's just remove those as a kind of urban renewal uh, program that could be underwritten by a company uh, like Google. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they would have a secondary interest in doing so because as it happens, as you might, as you might remember, Google provides uh, mapping services to all of us now. We don't use paper maps uh, anymore. And in fact, there's a, it's kind of a long history of obfuscating public space with, uh, with maps that sort of are, are false or slightly inaccurate in order that you can control what people know. The Soviet Union has a, a number of examples of this uh, that I don't have time to go into right now. Um, but um, if that's the case, then you know, the idea that we have public access or sort of general access to maps, uh, that might also begin to, to dissipate. Um, you know, maybe there's a service level kind of subscription to a kind of radius from yourself that you, that you can see, or maybe, maybe it's just in the interest of these, these new public-private partnerships uh, between municipalities and Uber and Google and so forth, to just eliminate uh, a citizen use of maps because all it does is cause trouble. People go places they shouldn't. Um, I'm not even talking about like, the, uh, the, you know, the obvious amplification of, of kind of the history of, uh, of redlining and other sorts of um, geographic uh, disparities that have, the, we're already seeing impacts in the way that, uh, that ordinary car services work in terms of access. Um, we could kind of go on down, down, this, down this road. And there's, there's a bunch of other uh, interesting scenarios. Um, parking, a lot of folks have started talking about the, the delight that will, that will come from the removal of parking lots, which are their own blight, paved over spaces. Um, uh, and you know, f that's, that's certainly likely, uh, but it's already happening with flat surface level parking lots especially in dense urban centers, uh, those are being bought up and turned into, um, uh, into tall uh, uh, you know, uh, luxury office and, and condo towers mostly, right? They're not mixed use spaces really. Uh, now you have sort of, uh, sort of expensive uh, condos and office space for companies that want to move back into the centers of cities after having spent decades uh, on their edges. Um, the parking lots though that exist infrastructurally that are sort of at the bottom level, sort of underground large buildings, it's not like those are going to go away. What, what might happen to those? They might become staging areas for these fleet cars. That's one thing that's been proposed. But an, another thing that strikes me is that I, I don't think, that, I think there's so much more space than you would ever need uh, to, to stage for, um, uh, for, for autonomous car service. Um, that, you know, how might you repurpose parking decks and um, underground parking structures? They could sort of become uh, a new uh, housing, because housing is very expensive. Uh, and we have all of these workers who want to live in the center of cities now, if there are still jobs for them after automation. Um, <laughs> but even if there aren't, we, we have some signals that this is already happening. Just on the way up, I read this, uh, this article 
In San Francisco, there are about 1,000 new apartments that are being generated out of old boiler rooms and basements. Um, so it's about 200 square feet, which is perfectly acceptable. A hotel room isn't much bigger than that. Uh, and at a bargain price of only $2,400 a month in San Francisco <laughs> on market. So you can imagine sort of, sort of, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, creating these, these, these sort of underground slums um, uh, for, for workers. So, and it, this would be a benefit, really. You wouldn't have to go out to the suburbs. <laughs> Because the suburbs are likely to become completely inaccessible, I think. We, we will, as we see more folks move in and densify urban cores, the cars won't even be necessary anymore. We'll have new pedestrian uh, mm -hmm. and, and bike corridors. And uh, uh, if you think about the way that Amazon has, has redeveloped um, uh, uh, Seattle, uh, the sort of South Lake Union uh, uh, area of, of, uh, of Seattle, and that sort of thing seems increasingly likely. So if you're wealthy enough to live in the city center, probably won't be bothered by autonomous cars at all, and maybe we'll see a shift into these sort of autonomous buses that ship people back out to the suburbs and the exurbs. Um, and then once you're out there, if you don't have a car anymore, you're completely screwed. What are you going to do? Um, so you'll, you'll be kind of under house arrest in those spaces. Or, or maybe, maybe we'll develop these, um, the, these kind of like illegal, um, you know, uh, human-driven um, taxi services that will, that will crop up. And that's not even to mention what happens to folks in rural areas uh, once they can't get access to uh, uh, electric or, or internal combustion uh, uh, engine vehicles if they're taken offline. Um, I also think about garages, about all, the, all of the in-town, not suburban, but kind of urban single-family garages uh, that exist all over America, which would no longer be necessary, really. You're not going to own these, these vehicles. Um, and so if you're lucky enough already to own a property like that, then you've got a kind of built-in Airbnb. This was like this kind of mass conversion. Uh, uh, you know, and there will, there will obviously be a, a kind of classist you know, uh, relationship with people who are, who are renting out these, these converted uh, uh, garage spaces, um, not to mention the fact that it only amplifies uh, you know, kind of existing wealth uh, inequality as we've, as we've built so much of our wealth in America for the every person around uh, property property ownership. Anyway, there's like, you know, dozens of these kinds of scenarios that we could, we could spin out. Um, I, I may be right or wrong. It doesn't really matter in some ways. It's rather that I if we sort of shift from thinking about the technology and the near-term problems to these, these, kind of, these kind of medium to long-term scenarios uh, that assume um, adoption at a universal scale and then run quest just ask questions about them, then you know that that sort of scenario, which you know bears some relationship to science fiction, some relationship to like Rand style scenario planning, <laughs> some relationship to to other kinds of, of futurism, but I think is still distinct from them because it's asking questions about like what is the current technology going to be what, when it when it flips its bit, mm -hmm. when it when it reverses, because that could still be changed as we're working in the present. So those are some thoughts. That's sort of what I what I came with. Yeah. No. I mean, I think that's a great um, a great launch pad for this um, conversation. And um, I guess I'm, I'd, I'd be interested in starting out the, the, the discussion part of this. And um, Ian, I um, agreed that uh, we early on very much want to involve the whole uh, audience here as part of this conversation. Um, but I thought, Ian, maybe as a prompt, since you uh, uh, introduced Kant into the conversation right from the get-go, um, Sorry for and that. And your own training uh, yeah. is, uh, has this, this really rich and interesting sort of crossover between uh, philosophy, theory, critique, and practice and make yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, that um, if maybe we, we could talk a little bit about pessimism as a stance. Yeah. Um, because, of course, in these various tetrads that um, you, were, uh, you wonderfully brought up uh, from the McLuhan era of media theory, um, you know, pessimism itself is is uh, often not pessimistic, right. but rather it is an intervention in an emerging set of debates, of concerns, of forces that run in different directions. Um, I mean, certainly for Nietzsche, pessimism, um, and, and for a whole strand of philosophical um, uh, critique, um, pessimism is the corrective. And in the case of autonomy, and I think you wonderfully spun out some of the potential ramifications of an autonomization of the world. But of course, the, the question in the word autonomy that um, coming from a philosophical background, one would immediately introduce is, of course, autonomy for whom? Like, who gets to be autonomous uh, right. in the service of what values? I mean, all of these 
various scenarios that you described, um, you know, from these worker colonies of, or, or maybe encampments in yeah. the exurbs right. of disenfranchised uh, uh, populations, um, they all raise this question. Uh, in, who, who gets to be the driver in the place of the driver, yeah. so to speak, whether it's the level of social forces or the architects of cities or who owns the public spaces, what is a public space? Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm, I'm just curious, given the, the extraordinary range of your own work, uh, how you see this kind of critical intervention in shaping that future yeah. conversation about the design of right. cities, because we're just at the beginning of that. I mean, I think as you suggested, this is a little bit different than some of the other cases right, that you started right, with. Right, right, um, I think, uh, so one, one thought I have about that is that when you, when you bring, when we think about the interaction between uh, technologists and philosophers, um, it's a sort of smarmy conversation we have about that interaction, right? Like, oh, yeah, we're, then we're going to bring you, the humanities are still important. We'll bring in these philosophers who help us. You know, it's, it's, all, it's like, oh, um, really? That, that's, that's all we can muster? Is this, this, sort of, this sort of smarmy appeal to, like, ethics? And, you know, which isn't to say that it's a bad thing to think about the moral implications. But I, I actually think it's a mistake. It's like almost a category error mm -hmm. to take these kinds of scenarios as, as just moral implications. They are in some ways... Um, uh, uh, metaphysical implications, right? They're like ontological implications. What it, we made this thing, we made this thing. It was blogs. It was the internet. It was uh, uh, it was it was smartphones. It was autonomous vehicles. Whatever it is, um, and we had the you know everyone has the best intentions, or at least something that's not the worst intentions. They had some good intentions, um, and then things got away. Things got away from us, right? It took on a life of its own. And the best we seem to the best conclusion we seem to come to. Uh, once those outcomes are unexpected, is oh well, this just once again proves that technology is 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 you know neither positive nor negative nor neutral, right? <laughs> okay, great. So uh, and then we're just left with the result, right. and then we just kind of like move on to the next thing as though nothing happened. Oh, just kind of wash our hands of it. So uh, you know, so to me, this this it, it's one way of getting at that answer is that um, you know this is this is the design is the space that sits between technology and philosophy. And unfortunately, design has also sort of been troubled in, in, the, in, in recent years as the sort of design thinking nonsense has taken over all conversations. You know, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, just basically it, it means uh, uh, speculative finance, right? Like everything, right? <laughs> design thinking is kind of speculative finance, like technology kind of speculative finance. The, the philosophers haven't yet gotten around to mm -hmm. casting their work as speculative finance, and so <laughs> that'll come though. That maybe <laughs> probably won't come. But, but anyway, um, so so design is this space where uh, where you know we 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 muster uh, abstraction uh, and make it concrete, and then and then it gets pushed out uh, in, in, into the world through uh, through implementation. Um, so I'm interested in that uh, that community or that mode of of thinking as one where you could you could begin asking questions instead of about about use or about outcomes. Uh, or about um, these sort of moral or social implications, mm -hmm. all of these kind of like smart frames that we draw around things, and that frankly, the folks who are making these technologies aren't that interested in hearing, um, and transform that into questions about uh, the, the essence mm -hmm. uh, of, of these um, uh, of these products or services or, or, or objects. So and, I mean, yeah. in the, just to jump in though, in, in the case of like your work on uh, game design, for example, the, the use of uh, interactive game platforms as um, spaces of cr critique or critical engagement of some form, would right, you see yeah. an, an analogous extension out into the sphere of uh, sort of get in under the hood and make or tweak or, or hack yeah, right. technologies? I mean, well, there was this, this, when I started working in games, you know, and I did all this work with kind of games and, and politics and education and, you know, I had this whole argument, um, this sort of like 150,000 word long army, I built a whole game studio around, you know, the idea that we could take the uh, the way that things behave, you know, they're, 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 uh, these systems of behavior, these complex systems mm -hmm. of behavior in the world, and because we have the capacity with software systems like games to depict those, those, system, those systems systemically in, in representational form, that we would be able to understand them, critique mm -hmm. them, may, maybe make alterations or, or claims about them uh, more easily. And that works in theory on paper, um, but it, what I, what, I, what I didn't think about at the time, you know, 10 plus years ago, 15 years ago, when I was working on this, is that those media objects and that whole design philosophy um, exists in the media ecosystem with everything else. So if you zoom back and you kind of imagine, okay, it's not just that we're, we're kind of making these, these representations of how things work 
uh, rather than depicting and describing them. But then we are also trying to alter the media landscape such that people are looking for understanding uh, and, and, um, and conversing about those kinds of systems. That's what would be necessary. Uh, and of course, that, that's not what happened at all. We, 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 uh, we don't talk about uh, like software model. Like you don't, you don't wake up in the morning and open your phone and look at the latest software model depiction of the current state of like, climate <laughs> or politics. Right? You read text, you look at images, you watch videos, mm -hmm. you listen to audio. It's just the 20th century. 20th century forever, <laughs> um, and so, you know, so like the, 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 the two lessons I would draw for, in answer to your question is that, on the one hand, I was, it's the same interest, right? This idea that there's there's sort of deep structure in things, uh, that their essence is very unpopular, right? No one likes to talk about it. They like to talk about transformation and change and becoming, um, but no, there's something about essence, uh, about deep structure that seems seems endemic to, to grasping uh, something, uh, which is one of the reasons why the McLuhans are, are of interest to me. Um, but then also that I made that very category error that, that I'm talking about I here today, which is that I thought that this was a design problem that was um, unrelated to other design problems in the media, or even not even design problems, just sort of sort of trends and flows. Um, and now that I, I mean, I really do believe that uh, that opportunity is like that 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 timeline has has been snipped. We don't know what it would be like what it would be like uh, to, to go down it uh, any longer. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm going to open up the floor here for just um, people to jump in. Uh, um, is D Daniel, are you going around with mics? Uh, yeah. So uh, if you would like to um, join the conversation, just uh, raise your hand and uh, Daniel will come over. Uh, yeah. Great talk, by the way. Um, I got a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask one of them and then you can tell me where it goes. First, I mean, is it, is it pessimism or is it creative destruction, right? I mean, that's an economic term as, as against a <laughs> philosophical, right? Economic philosophy. Yeah, well, I mean, the, so the economic position is that uh, it doesn't matter what happens uh, so long as there continues to be uh, 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 musterable productivity. There can be, the, so, that, so long as there can be an, like an economic machine that continues running. Whereas uh, pessimism says things are bad and they're getting worse. Right. Yeah. So you know, if, if, if the way that you measure goodness um, is through uh, economic value, then so long as, uh, as economic value continues to increase, and so long as it increases for the, for the agents for whom you think it's important that it increase, then you're fine. It's, it's all good. There's only optimism. Um, <laughs> and you know, there is, it, it's arguable that this position is, um, uh, is the strongest one, right? That even the, even the optimism, pessimism, like dyad is just a foil um, for a, for a true interest in uh, in continued uh, 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 economic productivity for a selectively uh, smaller and smaller uh, uh, group. And you know, it's an, so uh, it's not so. I don't think we can just dismiss that idea and say, well, obviously we don't want to go down that road because in fact that's the road we've been on for, for you know a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but if you take the interesting thing about the pessimist is like a uh, a sort of figure to embody, right? Is that it's it's this, it's this, you have a, it's like putting on a hat that says, I'm just gonna ask what's the worst case? You know, what's the worst possible scenario? Um, not because you're some sort of a masochist uh, or really a pessimist in the pessimist sense, everything is, is going to hell, but rather that, that posing that question, even from, even from the vantage point uh, of, a, uh, of economic development, right, mm -hmm. would allow you to see possible scenarios that you would otherwise miss. The interesting thing about the way that technology has been uh, proceeding, even, at the, even on the economic register, is that without asking any questions whatsoever, it seems to be working out, right? Like it, it, through, through accident rather than this sort of creative destruction uh, uh, kind of stuff, just through mostly through dumb luck. Uh, and, and then the kind of amplification of those scenarios, especially as, uh, as internet-based services have globalized and those sort of reamplify uh, the, the difficulty of, of, of finding new answers, of, of intervening in these systems. Um, like, so I'll give you one example, uh, which is probably on people's minds lately, which is this net neutrality uh, conversation, right? So I mean, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know if I want to touch this subject in this room. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> well, look, common carriage makes sense. It makes sense for broadband and wireless data to to be treated as common carriage, but at the same time, the internet is kind of garbage, and something that might change it in any way is worth <laughs> at least talking about. 
at least talking about, right? <laughs> but you can't even really do that. You can't even say, well, let's just like let's just like step back, and then you get yelled at um, <laughs> on Twitter or whatever by the you know by the throngs of uh, of uh, I don't even know what their what their position is. Like there's lefties, there's there's sort of these 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 kind of centrist libertarians that are the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of all over the map. <laughs> so we're 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 we've worked ourselves in, into a, into a corner with a lot of these these questions where we we can't even really pose. Um, Interesting questions about them, and one of the reasons we can't is because we're, we're stuck within these systems that are supposed that we're supposedly preserving, through, you know, by means of of taking on an, an obvious position like uh, like we want to make sure at all costs that uh, net neutrality doesn't disturb the sanctity of the internet, which we also believe is garbage. And now we have you know uh, uh, convincing evidence uh, has real negative uh, has had real negative implications on civic life and so forth. So yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I think that's the interesting thing about the, the pessimist wearing the pessimist hat. It's just it's a it's a license to sort of say, okay, um, you know, what is awful or what might go wrong, and let, let me at least think about that for five minutes, even if then I'm going to sort of shed it, take it off, and come back to reality. And just one follow-up thought experiment, right? So, if we were sitting, um, I'm in Buffalo, New York, where where I work, and um, you know, we had a analogous event, right, 150 years ago. We tried to build the Erie Canal which was kind of like a huge evolutionary <laughs> leap. We were trying to build a canal that would make boats go from Buffalo to New York City. But then as they started developing this high-tech event, uh, infrastructure pro project, um, trains came in, yeah. killed the canal. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. when the trains got done, right. highways came in, killed the trains. Uh, we can see the same, you know. And now it happens a lot faster. It happens yeah. with cable TV, yeah. it's network TV, right? We see that evolutionary process, mm -hmm. and I wonder if we were sitting in a room back then, <laughs> Would we be pessimists fighting that process mm -hmm. with that same view? Is it just history repeating itself with a new set of technologies? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the only other question. <laughs> Hello. Um, Sarah had mentioned going in that I would really enjoy this talk, and she was right. Um, <laughs> this is all I think about <laughs> all the time. Um, something that really struck out to me is earlier when you were talking about the blog example where there's just so much promise and you know you talk about like how much excitement there is around it and um, I'm a technologist I have worked at large tech companies and when I think of every product launch it's just like people are on stage talking about how cool it is that at any point in time you can tell someone it takes 15 minutes to get home and you don't really think about the kind of data that takes or what that means for someone's privacy etc um, and you mentioned also that um, you know when people build stuff they have good intentions and if anything, when I'm around here, I actually often hear the narrative that the Bay Area and Silicon Valley is only profit hungry and everyone right, cares right, about money right, and right. that they actually don't have good intentions right. and they're evil. <laughs> and so my question is, as I think about how to really shift the tides of my field, is it that people are profit hungry and, and evil and, and that's like the real narrative or is everyone actually just like way too optimistic and only wants good things and that's the blind side, and yeah. which side do you think it really lands on? It's a great on? point. And it's then how point. do we like mm -hmm. change it? Um, I mean, the short answer I, 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 I would give you is I think the vast majority of people are the, are are, uh, are blind optimists. Uh, they're not um, uh, power or wealth hungry um, extractionists or something. There are some of those, and one of the interesting features of uh, of the tech elite is that. Um, it's a particularly odious uh, kind of uh, power and wealth hunger, not because it's different from uh, other kinds of business or from or from finance, uh, which is I think the the ultimate uh, sort of you know uh, uh, reference point, um, but because it's dishonest about the power and wealth hunger, right? You talk to a to a hedgy and they're not going to be like, "I'm trying to change the world," right? <laughs> it's like straight up about it, right? Uh, whereas you, you know you talk to a, a tech VC or, or CEO and they, they will feed you that line, um, even whether it's whether it's true or false. And you look at like the behavior of a company like Uber, and it's it's pretty good. It's not all companies, right? But it's kind of clear. Where but then the folks who are the line workers, basically, they, they really are. Um, well, at first they're just trying to make a living, um, and and these are basically middle class jobs at this point in the sectors where uh, where tech is uh, is flourishing, um, and also they have the best intentions. Uh, they they do. Um, so they're also on the ground, you know, and there's a certain amount of power that uh, uh, that they have. Uh, but also, I think that 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 sort of whole modality of uh, of optimism, whether it's truthful or or, or, or false, right, um, has so we're just drunk on it, 
You know, like nothing, nothing can go wrong. And now that we have evidence that actually things kind of can go wrong, we weren't just kidding ourselves about that. There's an opening to say, okay, like, what are the if we can stop in our in our kind of daily, in our pragmatic level, the daily weekly processes uh, of building these these products and services, and start asking, okay, well, okay, so what happens? You know, we're going to roll this little test, you know, test out of this product. What happens when everyone in the world is using? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And then you know. Do we want to sort of backtrack from it at a design level? You could also introduce, um, you know, people talk about regulation and other forms of external control as being um, uh, important, and they are. I think that's another missing, missing bit to this. Um, but we've also kind of gone off the rails uh, uh, with uh, regulatory uh, management of, uh, of everything. Uh, so it's a pipe dream to think that that will suddenly like come online. Um, although it is interesting that the one thing that seems to have revitalized itself in the Trump era is, is corporate antitrust. Uh, which the you know eight years of uh, of Obama the kind of cool dad social media president and you know there was none of that was happening uh, so you know the um, I, in other words I think that I think that a purely uh, regulatory uh, uh, answer is is, uh, is is probably not going to come about and so unless we get inside the the ordinary everyday um, worker we have no hope of uh, of averting disasters of the future. But just to jump in on your question, isn't also one of the the expressions of pessimism uh, uh, better design practice, a, a better, a, a more widely informed? Uh, yeah, you know, and also like a slower design practice. I mean, th this business of speed is not just a matter of the increasing uh, speed of change in in business mm -hmm. and culture. It's also the speed of uh, of product and service development and deployment, mm -hmm. and we we've celebrated that for a long time, and you know, it allows us to make these do these experiments and make these changes, and we feel like we're not hurting anyone in so doing. But it's clear that actually, no, we are <laughs> we are hurting people uh, in so doing. Um, and you know, how do you dampen that? One of my hobby horses that's a little bit orthogonal to this to this talk, but is still relevant, is the so. Uh, Folks in computer in computing call themselves uh, software engineers, but they they've never adopted um, the orientation of uh, of civil service that the engineering professions did um, mm -hmm. through through pro professional engineering certification, but also through a, just a kind of uh, professional ethos, which is not that different from the way like journalists think about their work. Yeah. Um, and so it doesn't you know it doesn't all have to come from outside or from sort of like tight regulatory mm -hmm. control, but yeah, slowing slowing things down might also help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have another question over here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the glorious talk, and I really do think it was glorious. Um, <laughs> but I want to challenge its label as pessimism, because what I hear is an optimism that there will still be a civilization that will be making, you know, progress <laughs> for at least somebody um, or some small group, um, and you know. Uh, you mentioned Philip K. Dick, and you know when I think autonomous vehicles in the current structure, I think I go full, you know, Philip Dick, and think of, you know, fleets of abandoned or packs of abandoned autonomous vehicles, you know, wandering, you know, abandoned hulks of cities, right. you know, as the rest of us are going all, you know, Mad Max or The Walking Dead trying <laughs> to reinvent yeah. how you make bullets or something. <laughs> right. Um, so I, I guess my question is, why are you such an optimist? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're totally right. The, the pessimism sales pitch was just a lie to get you to come. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I had a similar question, which was, um, you know, your, your net neutrality example made me think that, uh, you know, you could frame being pro-net neutrality as a lack of pessimism. Um, about what neutrality means, or a lack of optimism about uh, what deregulation could lead to. So I'm, I'm wondering um, why you choose to frame it as pessimism rather than skepticism, just challenging your beliefs, whatever they are. And I wonder, is that because you think that in the realm of technology, we have an inherent bias towards being more willing to believe our positive self-deception than our negative self-deception? That's a good question. I, I don't... I don't know. I have to think about that, and I will think about that in, 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 many times uh, in, in, in the near future. I, I think my gut reaction is that um, for many years, pessimism was off the table. In the moment you started uh, making critical comments about contemporary technology, you were either a Luddite, um, you were just an obstructionist, you had your, your blinkered, you didn't understand. Um, and the la one, the maybe the only good thing that's happened in, in the last year or two is that 
that preconception has been stripped away. And now, okay, no, maybe, maybe, maybe we ought to be more critical. But I don't think like being critical or skepticism, it's, it's too modulated. It's too modest and moderate. Um, and it's, we need a counterpoint to that extreme optimism that we've suffered under for so long. So maybe if we go full pessimism for a while, knowing that it's extreme, that it's too much, then we can sort of find some reasonable space in the, in the middle. Uh, and this is maybe not that different from any sort of polarity that we might be experiencing today in politics and in, in social issues where uh, you know, the moment that you try to modulate in the middle, you actually end up just being pulled to whatever extreme is acting uh, in, in the most extreme way. So like it or not, we have to respond to that um, um, maybe in, excessively. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned at one point snipping off lines it feels to me like we're right now living in an edge effect time and how do you get out of that yeah well one of the amazing things about the arrow of time is that we don't we don't know what the alternatives mm -hmm. might be <laughs> um, and so you know traditionally science fiction speculative fiction or there's these sort of speculative design uh, uh, concepts that borrow from, from that, that, that premise, but for, for, for built objects or the built environment. One of the interesting things about uh, those traditions is that they ask questions about um, what could be, but typically it's allegorical. It's sort of, it's actually about the present. Um, whereas uh, it could also be about um, lost, there's sort of historical fiction or other ways of thinking about lost presence from alternate futures of our actual past, right? <laughs> um, and then there are the alternate uh, uh, futures of our actual present, which is not what uh, traditionally what, what science fiction does. Uh, and so if you, if you muster those objects uh, or those traditions or trends, whatever modes uh, as tools uh, deliberately um, in a way that doesn't like, I don't know, uh, throw them into the, the cultural abyss uh, of sci-fi, which is a problem, um, or uh, simply kind of, you know, uh, turn them back into these, these allegories uh, of the present couched as the future, then I think, I think that's one, that's one uh, possible tactic. It, 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 it's certainly not the only one, and it probably is, is insufficient, but it's one that I, that I think about a lot, that if, if, if we can just sort of open our eyes to this, this string theoretical, you know, uh, impossibility of, of all of the possible futures that we right now sit um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the intersection of, um, then we and we can think of them um, uh, as possible actual futures. But then we could we could design toward them rather than just like I don't know. We'll just do whatever. We'll just do whatever. You know, <laughs> like whatever happens is fine because we did it and then we meant to. And then you kind of tell the story of, of how you really meant to. Um, you know, then that kind of planning uh, <laughs> will, will look like planning at that point, right? right. <laughs> Just a follow-up. Um, so, so I read alternate history a lot. I look at that. I think about Kim Stanley Robinson has some great climate future histories. I can think that way, but how do we get the whole electorate to think that way? Yeah, when and you're that's like our big yeah. problem right now. It doesn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the, the, the whole electorate is probably not a good target market for, it, for, for much of anything. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you don't think about where change happens. It doesn't happen in the, from the will of the people, even though they often get to vote, at least in theory, uh, on these things. It happens um, at, at nodes of, uh, of power and influence. And, and so if we can change those, then we might, we might actually have more, um, we ha might have more influence on that, on that collective rather than going to them at the grassroots. So following up on that a little bit, um, Sarah Watson, I've been thinking a lot about the kind of trajectory of how these pessimistic or critical conversations have been happening, but also how they've changed over time. And I'm wondering, you know, even over the last two years, you know, thinking about the worst case scenario, we, a lot, plenty of people have talked about like the worst case of Facebook or, um, you know, kind of that and yet nothing happened or nothing yeah. was possible to happen mm -hmm. until a real worst case scenario actually happened and Russia, Russian interference being you know, one of these. Yeah, like we were talking about concrete. exactly this thing in the last election cycle. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. but like, exactly. it took the, the worst case thing to actually yeah. happen to, for anything, yeah. for, for a scale of people to actually care right. and for people to actually respond mm -hmm. and change things. So to that end, like, where is that line and where, what is the effect or how do you think about influence when 
you know, it's it takes that kind of worst case ex yeah, example. Yeah, I mean, I, I so either we're you know what are the what are the possibilities? We're we're idiots. Um, we <laughs> uh, we were like we were unpersuasive. It was not it was not important. Um, it was too seductive, and no one could see uh, the alternatives because they couldn't feel them. They were abstract. Um, it, it's possible that even though it seemed uh, like people are just very bad at future planning, and, f and so it seemed even p plausible, um, but that plausibility uh, didn't seem near enough in, in, in time to, to be actionable. Um, and I'm sure there are dozens of other possible cases that we could, that we could run. But now we've made, like, that's done. Um, and, you know, these, these sort of small trim tab adjustments that Facebook, for example, is making are probably not that, that important. So, you know, so giving up on that and moving on to something else is, you know, is one possible answer. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we, we have to start acting incredibly tactically. Um, and that is not something that, for example, the political left in America or the sort of, the sort of technology-friendly counter cyber libertarian uh, uh, community is very good at doing. It, it's just all idealism, you know? Um, and, and so moving back into, into, into tactics, the sort of like very pragmatic, real politic of this uh, might be one answer. Well, that, and that gets to the question of audience, right? Like to, what, to which audiences are you actually forming these interventions or reframings yeah. or whatever? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Like you have, um, you know, e e even if you, even if, like let's say you were to embrace just buying, just buying the solutions, right? Um, so we, you know, we need a, a sort of, you know, Koch brothers for, uh, for the left or something. And, like, you know, there are plenty of billionaires who are empathetic to this, um, but uh, they, are not, they are not going about the, uh, uh, their influence, using their, their, their money for influence in the same way, right? It's not, it's not as aggressive. Like, it's not that I'm going to, I don't know how you convince folks like that to do so. Um, but instead, they, like, buy media companies, right, and have, like, you know, kind of, like, uh, hobby newspapers or, or magazines or something like that, right? I'm, I'm curious, Ian, in, in the context of answering Sarah's question, you, you brought up uh, the notion of persuasion as a kind of core problem. And like where and how, you know, and of course, persuasion is the object of rhetoric, which is the most venerable theory of communication in the certainly Western cultural tradition. And uh, in your gaming work, persuasion has also been a key, a, a yeah. key issue. I guess I'm wondering, with uh, respect to the question that Sarah was asking, also the prior question, you know, where and how does persuasion happen and become efficacious in a kind of media space, yeah. a media ecology like the one we inhabit right. today? I mean, so the, the rhetorician, the good rhetorician, <laughs> um, you know, whether it's a, a, a Burkean or an Aristotelian, uh, has some understanding and respect for, for their audience and acknowledges that audience. Mm -hmm. And that may be the biggest missing bit if I had to pick one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's reasons, there's reasons for it, but without sort of understanding and coming to you know, it's not meeting them halfway. It's like meeting that audience almost all the way, maybe even more than all the way, um, in order to then uh, make an appeal uh, of some kind. So in, in some ways, these, these systems sort of reinforce the bad habits that, that draw us further and further away. Like one of the things we talk about a lot at The Atlantic and in media in general these days is this sort of problem of, the, you know, the coastal media elite that, you know, that the, the fake news uh, media environment that, 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 that Trump and others... Um, have successfully uh, antagonized, um, which which was and remains an actual problem. Um, you know, you live in New York or, 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 or D.C. Or, or or San Francisco or Los Angeles or wherever wherever it is that, that media gets made, and uh, and then occasionally you you know you drop ship a couple folks into Ohio to do some sort of uh, you know uh, it's almost it's almost like this sort of like. Uh, Colonialist affair, right? Uh, oh, look at look at the strange behavior of, of Middle America, right? Um, Natives. So you know, pe people are, are are reacting negatively to that for a reason. It's continuing. I mean, the New York mm -hmm. Times is, is particularly expert uh, at, at this, even uh, even in light of, of everything. Um, so that's just one example, but uh, but I think maybe that's the the most important bit. Uh, and I'm not. Um, I don't feel like I'm good at this yet, um, and so I feel sensitive about 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 calling it out as a. Um, as a bad habit, mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's the, the the big one. Like, what are what are people encountering experience? One reason we miss the Facebook stuff is people love Facebook; they love it. People love Google too. It's just like it may, it, it allows them to do things that feel magical uh, and that give them I immediate and enormous value. But what was like the best case version of that? Like influencing engineers to change things. 
Well, yeah, I mean, if we run these scenarios on the, the immediate past, we could probably, in hindsight, come up with some likely uh, scenarios that might have uh, averted certain kinds of effects that we might construe as negative and that others might not. But I don't know if that's where we want to spend our time. It's an interesting affair. Maybe you know, someone should be involved in, in thinking through that as a, as a way to move us into the present. Um, I'm not trying to be ahistorical here, even though we're, it's hard to even call this. We're talking about like two years ago. <laughs> yeah, you know? Exactly. Um, <laughs> what counts as history today? <laughs> but but the, you know, the urgency, uh, uh, because of this speed business, the urgency of the near future suggests that maybe, maybe we don't need to answer that question. Who has the mic? Hey. Um, <laughs> wait, is this on? Yeah, yeah okay. it's on. Uh, Moira Weigel, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, to, uh, following up on this stuff about politics and tactics, what is the significance of that split you alluded to between VCs and management and engineers and sort of rank and file tech workers? Because yeah. it seems to me that that's become, I think, both because of, as a result of the election and the sort of tech CEOs meeting with Trump after the election. Right and the increased material pressures of living in a place like the Bay Area, yeah. um, the reality that, for the most part, tech workers are labor and not capital, or whatever, you know, the idea that they're not, that most tech workers will never be VCs. Yeah. Or well, they're not be. capital owners, right. even That's though they might appear to be because they have stock <laughs> right. options or whatever. Right. And so I wanted to ask, in terms of politics and tactics and strategy, what do you see as, you know, in terms of thinking about civic responsibility or resisting the Philip K. Dick future? Like, yeah. what's that, I the mean, significance of that split? Yeah, it's, I, I, I guess the observations I have is that when, when outsiders make this claim, whether it's journalists or scholars or sort of, or, or, or even folks who are sort of, you know, um, inside of the tech world, but not necessarily in a, in a kind of what I'm calling a line worker capacity to kind of emphasize that, um, they don't seem credible for some reason, right? And you, and also th that, that crop of, uh, of labor is very inaccessible. They make themselves inaccessible and they're very tightly controlled by their organizations. So it actually be really hard to do a sort of on the ground investigative report of, um, uh, of worker life at, at, at Google. Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of reasons for it. So when we do see little bits and pieces of it, it's usually through financial or business news. Just, just this week, in fact, there was a, an interesting kind of kind of like a little uh, kind of uh, exhaust emitted of, of the world that, that, that you're drawing attention to, um, where uh, uh, Uber workers who hold, um, who hold options are trying to unload them in order that they can, they can turn them liquid, but um, unless there's a certain amount, because it's, it's all, all going through like SoftBank or something, um, then, then you know, there's this option to do a certain amount of deal, but then you have to have, you also be um, uh, uh, registered in the right way to be able to transact. And, there's all these kind of strange secondary markets for financial instruments these days, and you know, so that's that's where that reaches the surface. That's, that's it's, it's all about money, and no one like like how do you sell that to you know? Okay, you, you're, you're living on you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in San Francisco, and you have all these stock options. You want me to empathize with that? <laughs> so you know, th that and this is back to the business of audience actually. Yeah. So for for the the tech laborer to appear as a laborer like any other kind of laborer does something will have to, to, uh, to bring them together as a group and, uh, and create a kind of equivalence between their plight and the plight of quote unquote ordinary people, right? Uh, I don't know how I would go about doing that, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a tactical question rather than a, a sort of question of, uh, of, of ideals. I hear these stories all the time. People talk to me privately about yeah. them constantly. There is, a, and there is a group, at least in San Francisco, that has a chapter here that like helped with the Facebook um, cafeteria workers unionizing and stuff. Tech yeah, but it's always it's or, always those kind of workers, right? You know, when they go yeah. to the contract workers, they all yeah. get fired, I think. Well, people know about you know the the the, the Filipino scrubbing data, and people right. know about this, the 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 cafeteria workers. We we've seen good stuff, and th and that's because we, uh, this this sort of New York Times effect too. Yeah. Like that's the story that you know that appears to be bringing the the plight of the downtrodden to light. But it's just unseemly to say, well, yeah, I mean, there are these six-figure earning uh, uh, knowledge workers who are also the downtrodden. <laughs> that, that story is just not going to fly. How do we tell that story in a way that will? Uh, one last question. This may go back a little bit before you were born, but in 67, a Harvard economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, published a book called The New Industrial State. Mm -hmm. and I. It's a little simplification, but his main thesis was that 
um, perhaps the markets aren't so good allocators of capital, and you should have some kind of local deity that says, you know, basically where will capital go, what will be developed. And Galbraith was around 6'6", six, six, very tall. He looked around and couldn't find any local deity but himself. So he would, he would, <laughs> 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 he, he would tell us. I'm well. an MIT economist, so I'm not going <laughs> to say that. Um, it's true. Uh, so, okay, my question is then, given your observations and thinking even of plowshares, what we talked about when nuclear power was invented and how it would be turned, you know, the swords into plowshares, something for good, how do we proceed to get the good out of technology and, and uh, stop the evils. I, um, I did this piece uh, for The Atlantic, uh, I don't know, a few months back about this, uh, this kind of unassuming uh, New Zealander guy who um, lives mostly on a boat and he's in and out of, uh, of network access, right? He's, he's disconnected from the normal infrastructure, not to mention that down in that part of the world, they're already disconnected. It's already difficult to, um, um, uh, to get data um, of any kind uh, uh, in, in Australia and New Zealand. So one of, the, one of the great observations he made to me is well, there's a reason R-Sync was invented in Australia. Mm -hmm. right? like the, just the, the infrastructure of, uh, of connectivity, even fiber, um, is not such that it was uh, uh, reliable enough. Um, so anyway, um, he, he, is, he has been sort of reconstructing the same kinds of social media kind of tools, the same kind of consumer-facing tools um, uh, that, we, that we use at a global scale uh, at this distributed local scale. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, set of examples because it was like, well, maybe the problem isn't in the, the product design itself, but in the idea um, that all information should be globalized uh, and all access should be, should be globalized. And if you kind of stop and think for a second um, about the encounters that that you have on a day-to-day -day basis that are that are that are bad, that where, where, where these atrocities start to sort of bubble up, it's often because um, you want to be working at a maybe not a local level, maybe a local level, but at least not at a global level, and you just cannot anymore. Everything is is immediately globalized. So this isn't this isn't like um, a, a, a sufficient answer to your question, but it's one example uh, of, a, of an intervention. That you know, okay, it's still experimental. It's you know hardly uh, widespread, but you can I can kind of imagine folks uh, adopting. You start to see it happen, and and there are places where there are examples at scale uh, uh, that are good and bad. I mean, there's this lo lovely slash awful uh, 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 social media service called Nextdoor, um, which is you know mostly people complaining, uh, mostly 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 people demonstrating that they are in fact racists, <laughs> uh, or like complaining about dog poo, or like all the stuff that you know. <laughs> But as someone who's I'm like very involved in, in, in local land use politics in my in my uh, in my community, and um, and that's a hard sell to anyone. But actually, you know, through through a, an example like that, which is, is is globalized, so you sign up for this service, but then it gets localized down to your kind of neighborhood or the or the nearby area. You start to see um, more kind of productive, positive, um, or at least functional outcomes take place. Um, even even though the stories that people like to tell is. Um, you know how racist everyone on next door is, or how they just there's like a parody account on Twitter that's hilarious, <laughs> showing all the, the the ridiculous things people say. Um, but now you know, but now you can in fact uh, you know borrow a planer uh, from someone down the block, or or kind of talk about whatever you know whatever local school issue was going on, and um, and that sort of small scale intervention seems like people have given up on that almost. Like, well, why even bother? But the sort of all politics are local aphorism is is, is aphoristic for for a reason. So I, th I think I think you know in summary. If we have a bunch of these experiments that that are not aspiring towards singular answers for everyone, that are you know all billion plus dollar companies uh, that, that take over some giant some in, some entire sector, that would be a good start. What about uh, just uh, since you were focusing on on a kind of new model of localism? Uh, it, what about the pace issue? Yeah. Um, it, are there you know, um, ways of slowing down or creating that framework yeah. that, that I mean, allows for a different way of modeling, of, of building yeah, platforms, right. of, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think locality is one, uh, is one way into, into slowness, actually. Mm -hmm. So just, just the, the quantity of stuff you have to deal with. Like, think about all the things that happen in the world every day. And now think about all the things that happen uh, with your, within your sort of extended global community every day. And then zoom all the way down to your block or your floor or whatever. And there's just far fewer things mm -hmm. that happen at the local scale. And one of the reasons that many ordinary people um, appreciate and enjoy a platform like Facebook is that unlike us, unlike people who are in a room like this, 
they are mostly using it as a local conversation tool with a small group of people. Uh, and, and then they're extending that to a kind of global phenomenon, but that's not the global phenomenon that everyone encounters. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that we will slow down is, is not going to, oh, we'll just, let's just kind of pull the plug on this. And, I mean, you can imagine these sort of like experimental, you know, like Ulipian sorts of, you know, constraints applied to uh, these services that we use. But that, that's just like an indulgence of, of the elite to yeah. even ponder, <laughs> right? Um, so we have to get at them sideways mm -hmm. um, through, through other means. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, regulation is one of the things that slows uh, companies down. There was, this, there was this great piece recently about how Uber is, in essence, a, um, a regulatory arbitrage company. And so, <laughs> you know, like if, if, if your core business is, is regulatory arbitrage, then the kind of the more confusion you can throw at, at the apparatus while you're trying to work out the rest mm -hmm. um, would, would work out. Of course, enforcing, <laughs> enforcing regulation at the local um, and national level would be another way of going about it. Uh, but I think those answers, again, they're just all like super weird, very tactical, very boring. Like they're not the kinds of things that, 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 that ring of this kind of like, I found the answer that we're used to hearing from, uh, from tech and that we give an audience to. Are we good? All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Ian, especially.